It's okay. Um, well, welcome everybody. Um, it's great to uh, see some new people and some um, people that have been here before. It's always great to have a mix of both. Um, for those of you that are new, um, this is put on uh, by Passive Cash Flow for Life, which is a multifamily class, which is actually um, taught by Nicole, who is the speaker today. Um, Nicole has been doing multifamily for um, 25 years. And before that, she did a little bit of single family, figured out that she could do much better in multifamily, so made the transition um, and still has her single family rentals, um, but does not, for the most part, I think she dabbles in it a little bit with a partner, um, but for the most part, really sticks to multifamily. And um, tremendous, tremendous uh, teacher. Um, I took her class when it was a four-day in-person class, and it was like being fed with a fire hose. It was just so much information. So several years ago, we sat down and and she basically put the entire thing um, together specifically for online. And it went from four days or about 30 hours with breaks and stuff like that to 60 hours. So it's almost doubled. And we to see the, seem to have had some great success with it. People really like it. So we do this to kind of introduce um, ourselves to the community. Uh, but even more importantly, um, to really be able to share and help other people. People have helped Nicole. Nicole has helped me. Um, and, you know, um, I think that the uh, one of the nicest things you can do, or one of the best things you can do is really pass it forward. Right. So that's what uh, what this is about. So Nicole will spend anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes. She always goes long and I can't really complain because when I've done it, I've gone long. Um, and then whatever's left. We just spend time uh, answering questions about the topic or anything to do multifamily. And if there's not enough multifamily, we'll even take a shot at doing some single family stuff. Um, but there is the second part of this, which is the single family stuff, which starts at 730. Um, so I think, did I miss anything, Nicole? I think that was great. All right. So I think we are now at 634. You want to go ahead and get started? Sure. And just to kind of chime in there, um, um, Jane and um, Sharon's hand, wherever Sharon's hand is, it, are, are um, single family experts. So I used to do a lot of it, but um, they're, they are much more up to date on it um, these days than I am. So what we're going to talk about this week and next week are um, some of the numbers you need to know to be able to um, buy something before that you want to know before you buy. And um, this is a two-parter. So we're going to try and cover some of it today and answer some questions, and then we'll pick up the rest um, next week. So I think that this week we're going to just kind of can concentrate a little bit on just kind of the broad overview. And then next week, um, we're going to go back and we're going to talk a little bit about a, um, a form um, that we use um, to kind of figure this out. And we ought to be able to share that form, I think. So if we're going to talk about, this is what we're going to talk about, key numbers you need to know. Uh, I know some of you have been here in the past because we have talked about some of this before in um, in pieces. And this slide represents one of the things we've talked about before. Um, but I'm going to go back and hit it again. And so if you were here and heard me talk about this before, um, apologies. Um, we're going to kind of hit the highlights of it again. So when we are beginning, when we're first looking at a deal, we want to get kind of a general idea of whether this deal is going to work or not. So those first four numbers there, those four first four bullets are the things we really need to know um, initially before we even go further. So what we call them, this is kind of part of the sniff test. Um, I don't go when I go to look at properties because there are so many deals that don't work. I really don't want to spend very much time 
on um, on some of these properties. And so if I can figure out these four items, then I know if I am kind of in the ballpark at least. And the first item there is the first bullet is actually three things. And we call this the um, um, the asking price. And so you're going to see this as the um, income over um, V and R. The I is the income. That's the net operating income. Reminding us all the net operating income is income from all sources minus all expenses except the mortgage and the interest on the mortgage. That tells us basically what our income is after we've paid most of the expenses. The asking price is the V, the value, what value somebody's putting on it. And the R is the return on investment or the cap rate. And that gets to the point that if you were to buy something all cash, then the return on investment. So if you were to buy something, um, if somebody was selling something at an eight cap and you were to buy it all cash, not taking out any loans, then you theoretically would be getting an 8% return on your money. So now a lot of the things that are still being offered are down at five and six cap rates, although they're coming up. So what I have in this sub bullet is if you know two of the items, you can figure out the third. So if you know the NOI and you know what the asking price is, you can figure out what the cap rate is. And the other way, if you know what the income is and the cap rate, you can figure out what the asking price is. The value times the R times the cap rate is going to give you a sense of what the net operating income is. So for us to get the next three items, what we need is a current rent roll. Just one month, we need a current rent roll, but that rent roll needs to have all of the units in it and it needs to have any kind of vacancy, whether it be a, a vacant, physically vacant unit or an economic vacancy, meaning somebody isn't paying or somebody's living there um, at a reduced rate because they're working there or something, all right? So if I know that I have, um, 50 units and they are asking a thousand dollars for each unit, then I know what my, my potential gross is for that month and I multiply it out by 12 to get my annual gross, okay? That is going to tell me um, about where, if everything goes right about where it is. The next thing I need to know or at least, now if I know those four numbers, if I get an actual rent roll, I can figure out the potential gross, the actual gross, and the economic and physical vacancy. If what they are asking is more than 20%, if they're asking 20% more than I think I can offer, I'm probably just moving on or I will send a quick email to the broker saying, this is about where I am and why I am where I am. But those are the first numbers I need to know. Now we're going to kind of move on. If that was too fast and it was hard to follow, we did a Teaching Tuesday oh, a couple, three months ago that was called a sniff test or the um, first level in um, review. And it is out on our YouTube channel. All of our teaching Tuesdays are there and they're in a playlist. So you can go find that and listen to it and to get a better sense of what we're talking about here. Okay. The next thing I need to know, now we're moving on a little bit. So this may be, um, a little bit better now. So this is something we're starting to explore a little more. 
And the next thing I need to know are some of my expenses. I don't need to know all of them at this point, but the, my big expenses are taxes, insurance, property management, any kind of staff and, and kind of the maintenance. So I want to get some accurate numbers on those before I um, get too far into this. I particularly need to know what, not what the taxes are, but what they are going to be. Because most of the time I am buying these properties at a much higher cost than the person who bought them before did. And so I'm going to be paying more property tax than um, likely than the person who, who had it before me, who I'm buying it from. And so I need to go to the tax office in that jurisdiction and that community and find out what the mill rate is, meaning what is the rate they're charging per thousand unit of value. And then I just do the math you are going to find that that sticker shock a lot of times and it makes something go from a deal that um, that may work to one that it's questionable. So I would put in my head an asterisk behind that one because that's important to know before you go too much further in terms of expenses. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little more about expenses. Um. In a number of deals, when you're getting them particularly from brokers, um, but even when you are getting information from a um, seller who is kind of doing and um, selling it themselves for sale, that's um, kind of a FISBO kind of deal, that they're trying to sell it themselves, you need to really, you need to know what the expenses are but that needs to be taken into consideration with what typical expenses are. Because I have seen expenses be both way too high and way too low. And both are going to impact um, whether I can buy and what I can pay for it. So what I am... Um, what I am looking at here is that um, a lot of times, particularly if people have been managing these properties themselves and they're selling it themselves, their expenses are going to be too low. They are reporting expenses too low. In general, uh, my expenses plus a vacancy factor are somewhere between 45 and 60 percent of my income. Now to remind people, we buy apartment buildings, manufactured housing communities, and self-storage. Typically, apartment buildings are the most expensive and they are going to run 50 to 55 percent of income. Manufactured housing is going to run 45 to 50 and self-storage 40 to 45. The caveat with manufactured housing is that if you have a lot of homes on those parks that are owned by the property, as opposed to the, um, the residents. So on mobile home parks, you typically see a mix where the property um, own some of those homes and the residents own some of those homes. If you have um, a park that is mainly owned, that mainly the homes are owned by the park, you need to treat it like it's apartment because you are going to have expenses of, of the same kind of maintenance expenses you would if it was a, um, if it was an apartment. Okay. A lot of times they are doing, people there are doing their own repairs and maintenance. They'll be doing their own management. And so they, they can report, I've seen people report expenses at 20 and 25%. And 
and I'm not going to manage properties myself. Um, I am too scattered across the country and I don't want to work that hard anymore. So the, um, I need to bump up what I use for expenses. Okay. On the other hand, if somebody's reporting expenses at 75 or 85 percent, there should be places where you can find ways to cut expenses. That's just too high. Now, we're still going to use the expenses they're reporting um, when we figure out what we can offer them. But that's also a place where I can give a little because I know that I can manage those properties at less expense. And there's places I can trim those costs. So a later presentation, we'll talk more about expenses and where the different items should lie maybe and where some opportunities are to, um, to trim expenses. But that's not what we're talking about here, okay? The last bullet I want to talk about there are reserves, right? Reserves are typically when um, people are selling, they are not including reserves as part of their expenses because it really isn't an expense. It's extra money that you're not spending that you're putting um, in a bank account or someplace else for those things you have to do to keep the property up or in case they're unexpected expenses. But when I'm calculating how much I can pay, I do need to figure out how much I need to put aside for reserves. Because if I don't have that reserve cushion, then inevitably that property is going to sort of go down the tubes after a while, or it's not going to be as well maintained. So you really do need to calculate some money put aside for reserves when we're figuring out what our expenses are and what we can pay. Okay, this is another thing. We've talked another, one of the other classes, Teaching Tuesdays we did was on um, acquisition costs, right? And so... When you're figuring out how much you need to get into a deal, um, it is much more than the down payment because you are going to have closing costs, loan points. You're going to have, if you are doing a syndication where you are raising private money, and you're doing all the work, there's typically an acquisition fee. So um, there are other fees, other monies that go into our total acquisition costs. And the one am I kind of putting so much emphasis on this for two reasons. One, um, when somebody is selling, they're going to tell you, that it, they're selling it at an eight cap or um, um, seven and a half cap. But they rarely take into account all the money you have to bring in to close on that deal. And the truth of the matter is the money you have to bring in um, to close on a deal changes that cap rate because you are typically going to be bringing in seven to 8%. Um, so down payment is going to be 20 to 25%. And these other costs are likely to be anywhere from four to 7% if you're getting bank financing and things like that. If you're having to bring in money to do some repairs, to set up your accounts, those kinds of things. So you need to, when we're doing these deals, we need to figure out what our acquisition costs are. The other thing, the other reason we need to know that is because when we are getting private money or we are putting all the money in to close, whichever one works, 
that's how much we are bringing into this deal. And our cash on cash return or how hard our money is working for us is really based on the total acquisition costs, right? So um, the so when we, and I think I'm just gonna move on to this next slide. So this is typical of a part of one of the forms we use, which we are going to be using. Um, so the down payment is like we've said is typically, I don't have any numbers there, sorry, it's typically 20 to 25% for a commercial property. Closing costs, three to 5%. Now closing costs in terms includes attorney fees, it includes your SEC attorney, it includes the third party inspections like surveys, phase one evaluations. If you're doing a tra traditional lender, they're going to do some underwriting. They are going to get an appraisal and those are typically two to three points. You have to bring in money for repairs, for a bit of reserves, to set up accounts. And then if you're putting a deal together, you're typically going to get an acquisition fee that's anywhere from two to 3%. Um, and you're gonna add all that together and that becomes your total acquisition costs. So I'm gonna talk about these next two slides as part of this, because this is really part of the um, of the acquisition. Um, this is well part of what we're going to do with the acquisition. Um, and this is going to tell you whether this deal is going to make it or not. And then next week, we're going to talk about um, a couple of um, an, one other point, and we're going to go over that form. So one of the things we want to know, particularly if we're bringing in private money, is how much of the deal we can own. And part of that, the first thing is when you look at your investors, you need to determine what kind of return um, they want on their money. So the higher net worth a person is typically the more, the better return they want on their money. It generally is running anywhere from 12 to 15 to 16% annualized. So let me talk about that for just a minute. When we talk about annualized, if somebody, let's just say somebody wants 10% annualized, return on their investment. That means they want, if they're putting in a million dollars for ease, then they want 10%. Then that means they are looking to get $100,000 each year you hold that property. So if you're holding that five years, then their return is going to be about $500,000 for a 10% annualized return. Because remember, it's 10% a year. That's what they want as a return. You're holding it for five years. I'm sorry, I think I did that wrong in my head. So that's $100,000 a year, $500,000 over five years. But that is a mix of what they want in terms of money they're getting in cash flow from what the property is putting off every month or every quarter as a distribution and what they get on your exit when you refinance it or sell it. So you're going to take those numbers and you add them together to figure out what your annualized return is. Okay. Most investors are going to want, um, I would have said last year, a 6% um, return at least on the first year with the way of um, inflation 
a lot of times it's 8% now. So they want an 8% return on their money. And a lot of them are going to want a preferred return. So what's a preferred return? That means they get their money first before you get anything. First year is typically a problem in terms of getting good return um, on, on your money because you're having to stabilize a lot of properties, you're trying to get things done, um, you aren't going to see the benefits of a lot of raises and rents and things like that that first year. And so let's just say this, um, your investors want an 8% preferred return, and that's what you're promising them in the operating agreement. But first year, the property only throws off 6%. So in that first year, they get all of the cash flow. They get that 6% return. And you still owe them 2% from the next year. So it is basically a fixed return. And you can give it to them if you can't make it in the first year, that extra whatever percent rolls over to the second year. So in our example, they get the entire 6% year one. You don't get anything in cash flow. And in the second year, they get 10%, the 8% from that year and, 10, and the 2% from the year before. And then you would get the money after that, right? So frankly, this is something that kiboshes a lot of deals because you can't get people the returns they're wanting. Um, if I can get away without a preferred return, I would like to do that. Um, the larger properties, when you're buying them, you're typically needing people with more money to invest. Um, and they... Um, put deals before their financial advisors. And so preferred returns are pretty typical with them. All right. So what can they own? So I'm going to skip the rest of this because I think I tried to fix the this slide over here. And so this is an example that may make it a little bit easier. Once you know the part of the deal investors need so once you have, I'm sorry, I do need to come back to this. You Once you take their return percent, you're going to multiply it by the total acquisition costs. And that's going to tell you how much dollars they need um, every year. And I have an example in the next one. And then you're going to take that money and you're going to divide it by the projected cash flow to figure out what you can own. So let's do this. Let's take those um, those two middle thing, right? The investors re desired return in percent. So in this example, they want 8% times your acquisition costs. So let's just say between everything, it costs a million dollars to get into this deal. So what you're going to do, that's your total acquisition costs. So it's 8% times a million dollars. And they want, so that's $80,000 a year that is going to go to that investor, right? Now you're going to take that $80,000 and you're going to divide it by what you think your cash flow is going to be in the first year and or the second year to figure out um, what part of the deal they need to own to make these numbers work. Okay. Now this is a little simplistic because we actually do something that's a little more nuanced than this, but I want you to get the sense. So let's just say that in the first year in this property, we're thinking that it's going to put off $120,000 in cash flow. That's basically $10,000 a month in cash flow after everything is paid for. So $80,000 divided by the total cash flow 
is 66.6. So in this example, your investors would need to own two thirds of the deal and you would own the other third. What I will say here is that most of the time I am not going to use the first year numbers because they are typically so low to figure out what percent of the deal investors need to own. I also am going to tell you to be cautious of giving away too much of the deal because you need to make some money in this too. So that's this is part of what I end up figuring out before I go too far down the rabbit hole in terms of trying to figure out if this is doing all my due diligence is does the cash flow seem to be reasonable for both the investors and me to be able to make a reasonable return on my investment? First year numbers are generally low. So I'm going to look at the second year too. All right. And we just talked about the preferred investors. That's what I want to talk about right now. The next two slides I want to talk about next week, which are projecting out what your returns are going to be and how do you figure out exits. This slide is kind of, if you want to know more um, about us. So there, if you want to learn more about kind of what we do and get a better sense of um, what we teach, then we've done a webinar. It's about two hours long and it's for free and you can see it there at bit.ly um, backslash Passive Wealth webinar. Our website is passive. That's supposed to be for Passive cash flow for Life. Sorry about that extra L in there. And Passive Cash Flow for Life.com info at Passive Cash Flow for Life if you have questions. This is our YouTube channel um, for you to go get these um, Teaching Tuesdays. They're generally up on the Thursday. James is pretty good about that. And every Tuesday at 6 30, we have a call. A teaching Tuesday. Now we are not going to have a teaching Tuesday on July 4th, which is a Tuesday. So you, we're not going to do um, a teaching Tuesday on the 4th of July, but most of the time we do them on Tuesdays, every Tuesday. All right. So I kind of think that's kind of what I want to talk about. And I'm going to let, we're going to come back to some of this stuff and I'm going to let um, James or somebody else, you open your the uh, mics and we'll ask, let people ask questions as they will. I know we went kind of fast over this, um, but please jump in. That's what this is a community. We don't have that many people on, so you're welcome to ask your questions. James, are there any questions we need to get at there from on the chat? Uh, not quite yet, but I did want to bring up two quick things if I could. Sure, please. One is um, we have obviously a spreadsheet that does all this for you. Um, and when I first took Nicole's class, I was like, why would I do this by hand when I can just do it on a spreadsheet? If you learn how to do this by hand, you will know when you do the spreadsheet when there's a mistake. Because the spreadsheet is put in good stuff or put in bad stuff. You get out either good stuff or bad stuff. But if you've done it by hand, and you know how to do it to begin with, just this part for the most part, you know how to do it by hand, then obviously you'd be much, much better at underwriting. Um, and I will tell you, um, we did the spreadsheet, I don't know, four or five years ago, whatever it is. Nicole has thousands and thousands of units across the country. And for a long time, she did this by hand. So the system works, you know? Um, so I encourage everybody, and when we teach it, we teach it by hand first, and then we show you the, uh, the underwriting sheet after that. And then the other thing was, um, info at Passive Cash Flow for Life. Uh, this is my fault. That's originally the web, the um, email that we had. Now it is support at Passive Cash Flow for Life. So if you have a question now, a week from now, six months from now, whatever it is, uh, feel free to email us. Um, and that support actually comes to me, or you can do James at 
passive cash flow for life, either one. So um, that's all I wanted to say. So if you have a question, yeah, just unmute and please go ahead and speak up. I see 10 things in the chat box. What have you put in there? Uh, those are the links for everything. YouTube channel, uh, the email, the um, video, stuff like that. Okay, sounds good. All right. Please feel free to ask questions. I'm sure that um, I la had some confusion with people here. So um, please jump in. No? Well, I'll ask a question that I always had when I first started doing this and, and maybe I can you know, help people out and stuff like that. So as you mentioned on your first year um, is gonna be the year that you're turning around a lot of stuff. So the return is gonna be very low. On a preferred return, if they wanna make whatever, 8% every year for the first five years, have you ever seen it where you tell people or investors, listen, the preferred return on year one, is 5%. And then every year after that is 8%. Have you ever seen it mix and match or it's always got to be the same number? Nope. You can do, if you can talk your investors into that, then, then um, that's certainly something you can do. Um, there's nothing that says, I mean, your operating agreement is basically going to be what everybody is signing on to. Um, and agreeing and a lot of investors are going to be looking at that as well as the member interest purchase agreement um, to sort of um, want you to make changes in those things um, to um, reflect what their needs are. But if you can get somebody to agree to 5% in year one and then 8% thereafter, that works. That's a good question, actually. Great, thanks. Okay, I got a question. Okay, good. Um, I'm looking at a fourplex in the back house on Wednesday, and I am wondering if it would be wise to use the equity from that house as the down payment in closing. Okay, okay, so is this another house that you own? Um, it's if I get it, it'll be the third one. The first two are single family ones. Okay. So you're looking to use the equity in one of the houses you already own as a down payment for this fourplex? It'll be the equity in that fourplex if I if it's priced high enough and the asking price is low enough. And if the rent income will cover both. Um, I have never seen um, you be able to use the equity in a property you're buying. Typically, that equity belongs to the seller, not you. Mm -hmm. um, but it's possible if you have equity in your single family houses to pull some of that out as a down payment. Okay. Um to um on the fourplex but um i i have jane or sharon have you ever heard of somebody being able to do that or james um i've heard um like alex and i think sam too a couple of students um have done that i know when alex bought his 23 unit down in southern maryland he had several single family homes um, and he basically took out, um, I guess, equity loans on all of them, put it together, and then bought his um, his 22 unit um, based on that. But yeah, I've never heard about pulling equity out of the actual property you're trying to buy. Okay. I got one more question then. Sure. Have you ever heard of getting a loan based on the cash flow from the property? Uh, uh, in in multifamily they use the income approach. They don't use the, if you're asking, they, they don't use comparables. So it is, 
so when a bank or anybody underwrites a property to figure out um, if they're going to lend on that property at what you are trying to buy, they're going to use the projected cash flow or the actual cash flow to figure out um, how much they're willing to lend. Um, uh, is that what you were asking or you were asking using the cash flow for something else? I'm not sure. No, no, that's it. Okay. Yeah, that's, um, so single family houses, they use comparables. Mm -hmm. But we've talked before, if you are using, even if it's a single family house that you are going to rent, you really need to use an income approach for analysis to figure out what you can, what you can buy it for, because it's, um, it doesn't have anything to do what other people are paying for a house. It has to do with how much you can rent it for and what your expenses are going to be, et cetera. Okay, I understand. That's a good question. Thank you. Monty, you always have a question. Are you there, Monty? I think he's on mute. Yeah, I'm here. No questions? Well, you know, I'm just trying to see, you know, how I get into the market. I mean, I'm just still trying to study how to analyze the right deal and, you know, break into this business. And okay. I have a question about as far as what do you recommend for when you start acquiring properties? Should you put that property in a trust or an LLC or what? How should you structure your company? Yeah, so um, two things. One, um, a trust, um, a land trust, I assume you're talking about, is good for privacy so that it's harder for people to tell who owns it, but land trusts do not offer any kind of asset protection or protection from liability. So typically what you do is that you put a property in a land trust and the beneficiary of the land trust is an LLC because the LLC has actually has some asset protection. And then your LLC, you can own the LLC or you can own it with other people. So the answer is probably both. You're only going to use one. It would it should always be an LLC just because land trusts do not offer any asset protection. Hey, Gene. Thanks. Yep. Anybody else? Gene had put in asset based lending DSCR loan. Um, Gene, do you want to jump in and kind of talk a little bit about your, what you're referring to there? I mean, I know what they are, but I, I wasn't sure in relative to what. Oh, sorry. I was just responding to, I think, Nathan's question about um, getting lo loans based on the income of a property. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah. So, basically, uh, I've gotten a couple of asset based lending DSER loans from uh, local lenders. Uh, Lima One, I think they're, they're National One. And then um, uh, Washington Capital Partners, I think Dominion also is local they they give those um and they're going to be based on as nicole said on the income of the property um on a smaller they'll do single families as well that's what i've been okay. buying no i got it then i, I just wasn't sure <laughs> that's why yeah I yeah no no yeah i'm sorry yeah i just <laughs> preface that with nathan's okay. question no no problem yeah. Okay. yeah thanks i couldn't remember the initials of that was it what were the initials uh yeah DSC, um oh shoot what is that again um Debt service coverage ratio. Okay. Have so, you ever tried U.S. Bank? I have yeah, not tried. Yeah, it's it's um, DSR or DSCR, like you said there. Um, that is basically how much the property is going to cash flow in relation to the mortgage, and most lenders want at least. 
20 to 30 percent more than the mortgage um, for them to make a loan. So um, we talked about that in one of our earlier um, Teaching Tuesdays too, um, that it is um, that you, for a deal to be viable in a bank or a lender's eyes, you have to have reasonable amount of cash flow left after you've paid all of the bills plus the mortgage because you have to have a buffer there. Mm -hmm. You just have to have a buffer. Things can go wrong. And that's your cash flow that, you know, 20 or 30% over the mortgage is actually what you put in your pocket. Is that what you were thinking there? Um, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that's what I was trying to think of. All right. I have a question. Please. So uh, if I look at a market, market A, market B, like maybe Houston or, uh, you know, Dallas or something, and, mm -hmm. I, and I, and they say there's a 5.5% cap for a multifamily. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about that? I know uh, it, so maybe a higher the cap rate, uh, the more uh, valuable the pro uh the multifamily mean the meaning the more sort of, higher the valuation? Um, no, it's actually the opposite. So think of a cap rate as the as the money you would be making. So if you bought that a property um, at a five cap rate and you paid all cash for it, you'd be making five percent on your money. If you bought something at a nine cap rate and you paid all cash, you'd be being making 9% on your money. So the lower the cap rate, typically the higher the price they're asking. The, the, I mean, yeah, that's right. The, the lower the cap rate, the higher the asking price, the higher the cap rate, the lower the asking price. And that, in relation to net operating income, that would that would be because it's it's bringing in less, right? So the so they would be asking for less. So if you are, um, so if I for me to be able to get my cap rate, it's my net operating income. Let me find that where it is here. Exactly. All right, there it is. So if I, I is my net operating income, right? V uh -huh. is what they are asking for the property. It's their asking price. So the net operating income divided by the asking price actually equals my cap rate. So if they are asking on the other hand, the cap rate they're asking is 5%. Um, and I'm gonna divide that by my NOI. That tells me how much they're asking. Oh, okay. So it's a, the, the net operating income is just all of my income minus expenses, all expenses except the mortgage and the interest on the mortgage. I, because, so think of it right now, most interest rates are six to six and a half percent, right? Um, in the, in the uh, multifamily space, it may be a little bit higher. So you are, they are trying to give you at a five cap rate, they're trying to tell you you're going to get 5% return on your money, whereas if you have to borrow money, you're paying 6.5%. So your cost of money is more than your return um, on, the, on your money the, than the cap rate. The only place those kind of deals work is if you are buying something totally cash 
and you don't need a high return like some of the insurance things and some of the um, insurance companies and some of the um, the big um, like retirement um, accounts and things like that um, that because they just are interested in a a certain return on their money that they can predict. We need, I always want at least one and a half to buy something, at least one and a half to 2%. I want my cap rate to buy one and a half to 2% more than my cost of money. So right now, cost of money, let's just say it's six. I wanna buy at an eight cap rate seven and a half at the at the lowest because i want a spread between my cost of money and um what i can make on a deal does that make sense that way better explained yeah so the when the cap rate goes up the uh, price will go down correct okay got it correct and i want to be able to have people got real greedy um, when interest rates were so low and they were asking five, five and a half, six cap rates. And they were still, people are still trying to get away with that, although it's changing rapidly because lenders aren't lending on things like that when the interest rates are so much higher. Um, and people just can't get, get, can't get funding. So cap rates are coming up. They're going to, uh, in my opinion, they're going to continue to come up for the next six months to a year. But right now, I would be wanting to see a cap rate at eight or better, eight or more, for me to want to buy something. Just because, you know, interest rates are still going up, it's kind of, um, I want a, re a reasonable return on my money, et cetera. That get that, did that? Yeah. Um, so. So, so if, uh, if you have like a value add, so like, you know, you increase the rent or, or the uh, portion of the net operating income, like by, uh, so you have like 45 units, you know, mm -hmm. and then you have $150 more per month yep. added value. It's 87% occupied at a 5.5% cap rate. Uh, then, then that would give you a, based on your calculation, the valuation, right? Like, Oh, it, it's maybe I can put that in the chat. It would. It, I understand where you're going. That if you have some easy upside, like, like you have some rents that can go up. So based on um, your, you, or you, you have, have some vacancies you can fill. So, so uh, the is that issue, right? I put it in the issue, chat. Yeah, maybe okay. it'll help. Okay, so the issue for me with that, with what you're talking about there. Mm -hmm. is that you probably can't, if you increase the rents $150 in year one, you're going to lose a lot of residents. Mm -hmm. A lot of residents already have um, oh, leases. leases. Yeah. You can't raise the rents until their leases are up. The last thing you want is a lot of vacancies, all right? In terms of other kinds of, of things, um, if I want to, so one of the things I always think is that if a broker assistant tells me that, um, well, there's a lot of things you can do, so you can raise rents $150, and that justifies me telling you I'm selling this at a five and a half cap rate. My general return to them is, so what you want me to do is to pay you for the work I have to do to get to that cap, to get to that value. So they're asking you to give them all of this credit for, um, for a projection that may or may not happen and depends on you to happen. So I'm willing to buy that to a certain extent. Oh, um, I see. So, so 
I see. So if you if you project that 150 month increase, then the value if the seller goes, oh, I, I project the 150 dollar and uh, increase, so at the valuation there would be you know 1.4 million, but that's hypothetical. You don't know if that can actually occur. So it's it's kind of like a negotiation thing, right? Yeah, they're right now they're pretend numbers. Yeah. So and you mentioned the T T uh, rent T twelve or something like. Did you mention that? Yep, T twelve is is basically. So this is June. So a T twelve is um, somebody's going to give me the income and expenses for the twelve previous months. So um, January through May of this year and June through December of 20 of 22. So it's the previous 12 months by month. And that allows you to see basically, because in any property, you're going to have some months where you're paying taxes and insurance. And so you're, you're, um, you don't have a smooth curve, so to speak, because your expenses are going to be higher in some months. And it also allows you to see if you have any trends. If if the NOI is trending up, if it's trending down, if it's staying fairly flat. So a T12 allows you to see by month. So you actually can end up with 12 data points and some information about, you know, if there's, if you have, like with uh, RV parks, you tend to have better income in in the north in the summer and in the south in the winter because they're full right mm -hmm. um and so a t12 allows you to see those variations across 12 months does that make sense yes so that's the uh, net operating income over a 12 month period what well, t12 will tell you yeah what the um what the noi is or what the is each month and then you're going to add that up and divide it by 12 to get the noi a 12 the last 12 month noi oh so if you know that and then you know the r the cap rate then you can determine the valuation for the property yeah well you okay. can determine what what they what cap rate you're willing to pay given that and then therefore what you can offer you can also see what their what the seller is asking um, in relation to the NOI to see if it is anything worthwhile. Does that make okay. sense? Oh, that makes uh, yeah. That, I see. I understand. So the seller could lie. They could fudge the numbers, make the NOI look good, and you're going to probably pay a a high valuation. So the idea is to discount the property. If you need a lot of work, if it needs, if it's distressed or something like that, then your NOI would go down and the valuation would go down. So right. if that, you had to add a value, I see. So if you had to add, renovate it and stuff like that, then that's the potential renovation. And then I think you said, uh, based on that, you can project like the valuation and then the banks may look at that from what you said. Maybe yeah, I did, did um, I get that right? <laughs> uh, that's about right. That's about right. So if I'm going to have to rehab something, I'm going to be looking at how much I have to spend and what I think I'm going to get in return for that. Um, at this point, it's 730. So I appreciate everybody's questions, but I need to stop sharing here and turn this over.